All right, guys, we're in the home stretch now. We only got about two more videos left, so let's start knocking this out. Today, we are going to continue our theme with new imperialism, but we're talking about the new imperialism that was going into Southeast Asia. And make no mistake, the same way that the Europeans go into Africa, the same way they go into China, it's going to be the same thing going into Southeast Asia as well. So, let's specifically talk about Vietnam, okay? Now, at the beginning of the 18th century, we're going to see that the Vietnamese, they have a new royal family, okay? And the new royal family is the Nguyen family. Now, now look, the Nguyen family is going to be a little bit different. Although they have adopted for centuries certain aspects of Chinese culture and Chinese administration, the Nguyen family actually also starts to ally themselves with Catholic missionaries. Now, these Catholic missionaries are looking out for the best interest of not only Catholicism and making sure your soul's saved, but they're also looking out for the best interests of the French government. So this is going to bring the French into Vietnam. Now, that being said, the seed has been planted in the early 19th century, and we're going to see by 1858, Emperor Napoleon III is going to bring his army directly into Vietnam. Now, he's bringing that army directly into Vietnam to assert more control, especially more economic control, okay? So, in 1862, very much like other Asian empires, other Asian kingdoms, we're going to see that Vietnam begins to succumb to the French, all right? Now, the first thing is that they will offer up trade concessions. The Vietnamese will give the French three trade ports, do whatever they want with. Hey, trade all you want here. Okay? We're also going to see that they will allow the Chinese, or I'm sorry, they will allow the French access to the Mekong Delta and Saigon. They give them free ring along the Mekong River, which allows for more and more trade. Now, look, you would think this would be enough, but of course it's not going to be enough because if a little trade is good, well, then a lot of trade's even better. All right? So we're going to see after 1871, basically after they get humiliated by the Prussians, uh, we're going to see they, the French become much more imperialistic, and they're going to want to expand control over that area of Southeast Asia. Okay, So they begin to take over more and more parts of Vietnam, and of course that's met by Vietnamese resistance. Okay, Now, of course, the Vietnamese can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the French. So we see the Vietnamese, they, you know, essentially default to guerrilla warfare. All right, and so, you know, you're going to have these guerrillas. They're going to be attacking the French. The French will go and attack the guerrillas, but they'll also attack civilians too because they can't really tell. Okay? Now, the French attacking the populace, the French going after the guerrillas, was known as Vietnam pacification. Now look, that's just a nice way of saying, like, we're going to oppress you, we're going to put you under our, con our control, and so shut up and deal with it, okay? All right, so, by 1884, the French have taken all of Vietnam, okay? So, it, it, and keep in mind, it's not going to stop there. After they take all of Vietnam, they expand into Cambodia, they expand into Laos. So, we're going to get in 1897 the Federation of Indochina, and it's all controlled by the French, okay? Now, this is worth it for the French. This area is very, very profitable for them, okay? We're going to see that there is rubber to be exploited in this area, which we already talked about how important that is going to be for the Second Industrial Revolution. Uh, the rice exports is going to be very profitable for the French, okay? And keep in mind, look, some Vietnamese, some, some Chinese traders in this area, they will become profitable too, trading with the French. Okay? So look, the French have planted their flag in Indochina, Southeast Asia. Well, look, the British are still there too. Maybe not in Indochina, but the British, they're going to make their inroads into Burma. Okay? So let's talk about how the, French, how the British 
go into Burma. First thing, okay? Um, we're going to see that by the 1870s, the British will essentially control the southern part of Burma, okay? Now, the north was ruled by a Burmese king who essentially wanted to reform, wanted to modernize his army. And look, he's reforming and trying to modernize his army to hold off the Europeans, okay? Now, look, he's not going to be able to do this, okay? So we're going to see in 1886, the British will send troops from India to the capital of Mandalay. All right, and, and look, it's not going to be an immediate victory. You know, it's not going to be a, a route. But given within five years, now Britain will be controlling the larger part of Burma. They pretty much have it under control. Now, of course, like other places, the British don't really necessarily care about your customs. They don't really care about what you do, all right? They just want you to trade, and they want you to listen to the British, okay? So, also, too, the British will send governmental administrators. They'll build railroads. They'll build canals. And, look, they're doing things that facilitate trade for the British. Now, look, I, I guess an uh, indirect effect is that it also will eventually help the people of Burma, too. Okay. Now, um, one last thing. With the building of the Suez Canal in 1869, remember the Suez Canal connects the Mediterranean Seas to the Red Seas. It makes travel and shipping and transportation much more rapid between Europe and its colonies in Asia. We're going to see that Britain does take more of a direct control in Burma. Okay. No longer will it be you know, okay, well, we'll have some oversight, but you can just run the day-to-day -day operations. We're going to see that, look, now you can have access to more and more trade more and more frequently. There's more money to be had. So we're going to see the British definitely puts a, a more direct control over Burma at this time. Okay. All right. Now, let's go into the next one. Let, let's talk about some of the other areas that are, you know, being taken over imperialistically by European powers, okay? So, uh, the first one, let's talk about the Dutch. Let's talk about the Dutch in Indonesia, okay? Because they've been there a long time, and they're really not going away anytime soon, okay? So we're going to see that the Dutch East India Company, arguably the area that started to solidify itself in Indonesia, is actually disbanded in 1799. Okay, so the Dutch East India Company is disbanded, and we start to see that doesn't end Dutch occupation there. It just starts to create where the Dutch government has more direct control over these islands. Okay, now in 1830, the Dutch will impose, I guess, farming restrictions on the island of Java, which is the biggest one. Okay, all right, and they're forcing these Dutch farmers to say, hey, you're not going to grow rice anymore. We want you to grow sugar. All right? Don't grow your staple crop and live. Grow this cash crop so we can exploit it to the rest of Europe. All right? So, um, you know, look, they're going to pay for sugar at a very low price on these islands. They will take it back to Europe and sell it at an exorbitant price. Okay? Now, Originally, the Dutch were using the local rulers, okay? They were working with the local rulers, the local sultans. They were saying, look, we want to be teammates with you. You provide the crops. You provide the spices. We'll go sell it. But we're going to see that, just like everybody else, the Dutch is going to start putting a more direct control over these areas and they're not going to be submissive to the local rulers. They're going to be. They're going to demand that the local rulers will be submissive to them. In addition to some of the larger islands like Java and Sumatra, the, the Dutch will expand. They will start taking islands like Bali, and they'll do the same things over and over and over again. Okay. All right. Lastly, we're going to talk about a new player. All right, 
And let's talk about the United States, which we really haven't talked about much, okay? With the United States, they get in on the imperialistic game as well. They realize if they want to be a world power, if they want a seat at the table, they got to go get themselves some territories. And they will. The first one is going to be the Hawaiian Islands. Okay? And we're going to see in 1898, really against the, the wishes of a lot of native Hawaiians, the U.S. will eventually annex Hawaii. And eventually later on make it a state. Okay? Lots of sugar to be had there. Also, strategically, Hawaii works out very well because it's like a pit stop between, say, California and China. All right? it, it's a place strategically to have military bases and to have coaling stations. Okay? All right. um, also in 1898, we have the Spanish-American War, which historians will also call the Splendid Little War because it was a butt whooping. The United States mauls Spain. It embarrasses Spain, okay? So we're going to see that out of the Spanish-American War in Asia, the U.S. will acquire the Philippines, where, where a lot of the fighting actually took place. It took place in Cuba. It took place in the Philippines, okay? So with the Philippines, the Spanish had controlled that ever since the... Early 15th, uh, early 16th century. Okay. Well, now it is under U.S. control. Now, look, in all, I guess, in all fairness to the Spanish, you know, they actually sold the Philippines to the United States. Now, they sold it at a very, very cheap cost. Also, too, at the time, there was a Filipino rebellion that had a lot of fuel of nationalism behind it. So the Spanish were like, "Well, we just got our butts kicked by the Americans." There's, there's a nationalistic revolt on our territory in the Philippines, and I guess the Americans are offering us pennies on the dial, dollar. Let's just sell it. All right? So they do sell it, and, you know, the United States does acquire the Philippines. And they'll hold the Philippines for the next couple decades. Okay? Now, keep in mind, a lot of Americans, you know, a lot of Americans are like, yes, yes, we need to be imperialistic. We're going to take area. We'll look awesome. A lot of Americans, too, were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're going to go conquer islands? You know, this country was founded on people who didn't want to be conquered by an imperialist nation. Britain. All right, so a lot of people were against it as well. Okay. All right, in the next video, we're going to talk about some of the, some of the kingdoms that held tough and actually resisted European rule. See you on a second.